Madame la conseillère d'État, Monsieur le Président de la Banque Nationale, Monsieur le Président du Conseil des EPF, and I'll stop here, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. It's a fantastic, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here for the lecture by Jean-Pierre Dantin. It's called the Campus Lecture. It's what at TPFL we call the honorary lecture when a professor goes into retirement. I'm sure Jean-Pierre is not going into retirement, don't worry. Um, the tradition at EPFL is that the professor gives an honorary lecture and we give an honorary title of professor, which we'll do in the formal part uh, of the proceedings. Uh, but as you saw from the program, there will be more to it. And uh, in particular, after my few words at the beginning, there will be uh, the lecture by Jean-Pierre Dantin. I'm very much looking forward to this. Then a special address by the director of the College du Management, where Jean-Pierre uh, is a professor. And then we have a distinguished panel with Isabelle Moret, Thomas Jordan, uh, Noleg Forrest, and uh, it's run by David Bach from IMD. Also, that I'm very clear, Jean-Pierre Dantin worked uh, formally, I think, for EPFL, I'm not sure, but he worked on a project that is uh, run together between University of Lausanne and I haven't seen Frédéric Hermont, but uh, maybe he's in the room, I'm not sure. And by IMD, and my friend Jean-François Manzoni is here, and so this is really the honorary lecture of three institutions here in Lausanne, IMD, University of Lausanne, and EPFL. So that it's very clear, okay? Because I, I know Jean-François is looking at me with a very sharp eye and checking, and <laughs> my HOC friends as well. <laughs> All right, and so let me get going. I'll be very informal here. You know, I could spend, I think in the program 15 minutes, I could spend 15 minutes reading all the achievements of Jean-Pierre Dantin, his many papers, his books. Uh, he's also a fantastic lecturer, you will see this. Um, instead, I'll do something a little bit less formal. Uh, well, I'll do a few formal things still. Jean-Pierre, as you probably know, is a dual citizen uh, between Belgium and Switzerland. Uh, he was born in Belgium a few years ago and uh, graduated from, uh, from KU Leuven, not Leuven, Leuven actually, is that no? Well, Wikipedia is wrong, man, sorry. Okay, so it was Leuven, I, I thought so, right? <laughs> Leuven in Leuven. Leuven in Leuven, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll make a little parenthesis here. If there is something to learn, that's not what we want to do in Switzerland, right? <laughs> if you know the history of Louvain and Leuven. Uh, but that's another story. All right, and then he went to Carnegie Mellon in beautiful Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, right, I believe. Uh, it must have been very hard to move to Arclemanic from Pittsburgh, uh, but you did it. Uh, he wrote a dissertation, which is actually a math dissertation, Equilibrium Analysis of Speculative Markets, Implications of Rationality on the Behavior and Characteristics of Equilibrium Prices. I'll stop here, because I don't understand it. Uh, but it's a math thesis, and you have had math PhD students, and one of them is actually, I think, currently at HEC Lausanne, Elmar Mertens. Okay. Um, then you lectured at various places in the US, and I think that's where, I think we sort of met, okay? So let me go to the less formal part here. Okay, so this is the formal introduction of Jean-Pierre. And uh, for a few years, I was watching you, Jean-Pierre, but you didn't know it, okay? So this is a, <laughs> the business school at Columbia University. And the view is actually from the building where I had my office. And we would, I shouldn't say we look down, right? Because that would give a wrong impression. Um, but that's the actual picture. I asked a friend of mine who is still in the same building on the same floor to take the picture a few weeks ago. And, um, and I was busy doing you know, some engineering stuff. And Jean-Pierre was up for a fantastic career in finance at one of the best business schools in the world, which is Columbia University. But we never met, actually, okay? Uh, because I guess we were in different universes, okay? And so when did we meet? We, meet, uh, we met, sorry, we met here uh, in Lausanne when after Pittsburgh and New York, and New York is a nice place, I have to say, um, and a few other 
passages in various academic places, uh, Jean-Pierre is a, is, a, is a traveler in the academic world, he came to UNIL, to HEC, and then we had an interaction about building financial engineering at OPFL. And I think the interaction was because you were running uh, the Swiss Finance Institute, right? And uh, some of the professors in this uh, construction were actually members of the Swiss Finance Institute that Jean-Pierre had set up and had been running very successfully you know, in, besides many other things he was doing at the time. And um, that's when I started to um, really like economists, because economists have, um, you know, physicists have fundamental laws, and uh, economists have laws that govern society. And these two things are quite different. I'll come back to it. But for example, I learned probably from you, uh, for example, Goodhart's law. So Goodhart was, uh, I think, the... Uh, head of the Bank of England at some point, or, well, some British economist, and you probably know uh, Goodhart's law, very important, can be used for many different things, for example, for measuring academic performance. Uh, <laughs> that's why, where I use it. Uh, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure, okay? You all have heard this, it has many variations, but it's actually very, very important, is that the minute you try to steer the boat, you have to be very careful because what you do, you know, you steer and there it will be counter steering. What you measure will be gamed. And uh, certainly in the business we are in, the academic business, this is a matter of concern. Good. Now, he left, he left um, HEC Lausanne to go to Bern. And by coincidence, I also went to Bern roughly at the same time. And... Um, there is another law, it's called Sutton's Law. I don't know who knows Sutton's Law. Willie Sutton was a bank robber, okay, by trade. And the reporter asked him, why do you rob banks? And he answered, because that's where the money is, okay? Now, <laughs> sounds totally obvious, but it's a law, actually. You can look it up on Wikipedia. And I happened to go also to Bern, also because that's where the money is, okay? And so we go to two different buildings, okay? So on the... Right hand side, you see the beautiful building of the Swiss National Bank, where Jean Pierre was a member of the board and vice president, actually, of the Swiss National Bank. And I would go to Parliament trying to talk to politicians. I have to be careful because a few are in the room, and I would talk to Isabel every now and then. Um, and, you know, okay, that's where we met. Now, there is a little story, it's an anecdote. Uh, so, since we knew each other, we would go for lunch every now and then. And so, <clears throat> We go to Jack's uh, Brasserie, which is a place where people meet in Bern. And, uh, you know, at the end of the meal, Jean-Pierre absolutely insists to pay for the meal, right? And I wanted to pay, he wanted to pay, and so on. In the end, he wins, he takes his uh, credit card, tries to pay the bill. The credit card doesn't work. And so I look at Jean-Pierre, I say, is there a problem with the Swiss National Bank? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I paid. Uh, <laughs> okay. Then from the Swiss National Bank, I mean, I was a little bit surprised. Here is one of the most outstanding academics and economists and very versatile and broad person, and we let him go to Paris instead of putting him to work in Switzerland, okay? And so he went to the Paris School of Economics, uh, which is the merger of seven departments in Paris to create one single Paris School of Economics, which, by the way, is now ranked number five in the world, I think, among uh, School of Economics, ahead of Toulouse. I think that was the only goal, actually, in the French system. It was not to be number five in the world. It was to be Paris ahead of Toulouse, which you succeeded. And, um, and I was absolutely not aware of this. I guess I was, you know, in some other planet. And then one day, uh, I, I come back from Bern. On the, this is a true story, right? Jean-Pierre, you remember? <laughs> so, uh, you know, at 10 p.m. or something, and uh, we meet on, uh, in the train station. He just steps out of the TGV from Paris, and I from the little train from Bern, and I say, Jean-Pierre, what are you doing, right? He says, well, I'm coming back from Paris because of the Paris School of Economics. And so he tells me the story about merging seven departments in France, in Paris. And if you know France, you know Paris, you know how hard this can be, right? So I said, 
Jean-Pierre, if you can do this, you can merge the five schools of economics of Arc Lemanic. Okay, that's what yeah, we discussed. And um, we are on the way, but we are not quite there. Okay, so <laughs> we have made strides in that direction. I can hear people laughing. Uh, so, so we discover Arc Lemanic is more complicated than Paris. Okay, that's the good news. Uh, <laughs> the bad news is that, you know, if we can't put things together in Switzerland, we'll be not number five in the world ranking, I can tell you that. Um, and so we started discussing. And the basis of the discussion was a New Yorker cartoon. Okay? And the New Yorker cartoon, I forgot to put it here, but I send you a copy for whoever wants it. The New Yorker cartoon, because we are both in New York, right? So we would read the New Yorker, and there is a tradition of New Yorker cartoons, and sort of a particular sense of humor. And the New Yorker cartoon showed a few people sitting in a cave after the end of civilization as we know it. Okay? And one of the fellows sits around the fire and he says, yes, we destroyed the planet, but for a beautiful moment in history, we created a lot of value for shareholders. Okay, please note. Okay? Now, I, I'm on the side of the New Yorker cartoon. Um, uh, Jean-Pierre was on the side of free markets and equilibrium and so on. And so we had very lively debates about this for, I, I forget, now we worked together for, what, five years, seven years, something. And um, I must say, I almost, always very much enjoyed the intellectual debate uh, with Jean-Pierre. And I also must thank him for his uh, infinite patience, because I have no idea about economics. And I would ask very naive questions. I would send emails with some random suggestions how we could actually run different ways uh, of markets and so on. And he would always very politely answer, OK, uh, making a lot of sense. And ultimately, from this initial conversation, we started what's called Enterprise for Society. Now, Enterprise for Society, and I said I'm only here a placeholder for three institutions, UNIL and HEC and IMD. Enterprise for Society is the idea that, you know, technologists alone are not going to fix the climate crisis, okay? And economists alone probably will not fix the climate crisis either, as uh, New Yorker cartoons seem to indicate. And it's only if we work together that, that scientists and technologists work together with economists and business people and management people and the real economy that hopefully will be able to uh, solve the climate crisis. And right now, this is a good moment in history, by the way, because we have perfect timing. We have both an energy and a climate crisis, and these two things are extremely intertwined, and we need to solve you know, the two at once. And so, Jean-Pierre, uh, started uh, Enterprise for Society, we got uh, the partners on board, we launched a new master in sustainable management and technology. Here is the opening event uh, where Bertrand Picard gave a, a very uh, motivational talk to the students and so on. And I don't want to speak too much about E4S because I'm sure uh, Jean-Pierre and others will talk about this. But among all the things we have sort of tried at EPFL, that's maybe one of the most original ones. I mean, we do all, many other ones, right? We do a center for AI, we do something on green energy. This is sort of obvious for EPFL, uh, but Enterprise for Society certainly wasn't obvious, okay? And it was also something that was not completely understood at EPFL, but I still believe this is the right thing to do, is to work together with our partners in Arc Lemanic in Switzerland and beyond to merge technological solutions with new ways to run the economy so that we can actually achieve zero, net, net zero by 2050. And for this, I would like to thank Jean-Pierre, because without Jean-Pierre, we, we would have done very little progress on this extremely important dimension. Now, there are other initiatives in Switzerland, many of them, uh, coming here. You know, I read the brochure, La Finance Durable, Rapport de Gestion de Fortune, etc. So I'm sure many people work on it. Um, but you know, uh, the real thing will happen when we transform the way we look at sustainability, that we look at resources, we look at growth, uh, we look at energy and so on in a holistic combined view. And this is what we're trying to do 
and doing at Enterprise for Society. So with this, I uh, present you the fantastic building of uh, Enterprise for Society, Villa Bocobon, uh, uh, courtesy of uh, University of Lausanne. Merci beaucoup, Frédéric. Um, so there is room, okay, for growth. <laughs> Even though we work on degrowth. Um, uh, but I, I'm totally bullish about this. I think there are relatively few places in the world where you get an institute of technology working with a management school and the school of economics to try to address these fundamental problems. I'm sure we'll hear more about this from Jean-Pierre, from Rudi Fallenbach, the director of the College du Management, and of course later in uh, the round table we are going to have just at the end of this. So with this, merci beaucoup Jean-Pierre, c'était un immense plaisir de travailler avec toi. Over to your lecture. Merci Martin. Merci à tous d'être là pour cette euh, farewell lecture. Euh, bien sûr, ce serait plus agréable de cette, avoir une inaugural lecture, mais à un moment donné, ben, on va faire une farewell lecture. Donc voilà, je suis heureux d'être là. Euh, merci de ces, ces phrases. Et je, enfin, la principale chose que je voudrais dire, c'est que ça a été une magnifique opportunité. Alors, tu, tu me remercies pour Iforest, je te remercie pour l'opportunité que tu m'as offerte, cette, un, 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 une réflexion, ça a commencé vraiment par une réflexion, par, par du papier, par des idées, et, et c'est une entreprise dont, dont je suis fier, mais en plus qui m'a procuré éno, énormément de plaisir pendant les quelques années dans lesquelles j'y dans lesquelles j'y ai travaillé, et euh, euh, je Je ne peux qu'en être reconnaissant. Non, je suis en train de parler français. That was not the idea. I'm sorry. Let me go back. I'm not going to repeat what I say because everybody understood. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, everyone, to be here. So I am uh, going to give my farewell lecture, or what is my honorary lecture. Uh, it's not going to be a traditional lecture. I'm not going to spend much time on my, uh, on my own uh, intellectual career. Um, I don't think if I had promised to do so, you would be so many in the room. I've decided to talk about uh, capitalism and the planet. Is it an impossible marriage? And that's what I'm going to uh, focus on. Uh, still, I will um, say a few words about uh, my past, and I will do so to the extent that it has a relationship with, uh, with the, the, the title of the lecture. So. Uh, I'm going to say a few things, three things, in fact. I'm going to talk about uh, my academic background a little bit, but that's, again, the, that's the context of the, of, the, of the message. Then I'm going to talk about capitalism and the planet. Uh, you already saw that I switched to something else, the welfare theorems and the planet. I'm going to explain why, why this switch. And I certainly, and the message, if you start to fall asleep, the thing that you should remember, the planetary boundaries, I'm going to talk about them, are a game changer. It's something extremely important uh, uh, that uh, we need to talk about and uh, analyze the implication, and E4S has much to do with that. Uh, then, in the third level, I will go to the second part of the title, an impossible marriage. Uh, do we need a system change? Because that's, of course, what is, what is implied. Do we need to change the system? Uh, do we need a radically new system, or do we need to, to improve the system? And I will conclude with the fact that I think a happy marriage is possible, but under some conditions, and I will spell these conditions. So, uh, let's get started. Uh, a little bit of uh, academic background, and immediately I'm come up with important picture. The picture of Leon Valras and Vilfredo Pareto, who are the most famous professor that ever lived on the campus of the University of Lausanne, I think. Uh, well, they were not on the campus, they were in La Cité, and they were contr major contributors to this chapter of economics that we call General Equilibrium and Welfare Economics. And that will be the red thread of my speech. I will talk uh, in the spirit of uh, welfare economics, uh, and I'll say a moment for, uh, why for a moment. So, fil rouge, uh, welfare economics, it's 
quite interesting. And you will say, I'm talking about that because this is the, the, the reflex of a, a new immigrant in his new homeland, right? I mean, I, I want to be more Swiss than the Swiss, so I talk about Ecole de Lausanne. Well, that's not quite true. Uh, in fact, in Louvain, Louvain, Université Catholique de Louvain, in Leuven, because at the time, the L'Université Catholique de Louvain was situated, it was located in the city, in the Flemish city of Leuven. So my alma mater is the University of Louvain, but indeed, Wikipedia is wrong. I'm not in the KUL, the Catholic Université de Leuven. I, am, I was in the Université de Louvain. And that's where I discovered this chapter of economics. I was really enthralled by, by the elegance of, of the theories that underlie uh, the general equilibrium and, and welfare economics. And I wrote my master thesis in 1972. Yes, it's not yesterday, I know, but okay. I wrote my master's thesis in 1972. I mean, my excuse, I was very young. I was 22 years old. Uh, and I wrote it at, uh, on the equilibrium and optimum of in the presence of pollution and cleanup possibilities. In other words, it was really an exercise in general equilibrium, in optimum analysis, Pareto optimal, I'm coming to that in a second, uh, where we introduce pollution. Okay, that is a first sort of an externality. And I, I dis rediscovered that. I read my first, the first page of my thesis and I, I almost came and, and wanted to read it to you because it was not bad at all. And it was already talking about the big topic of today. And then I moved, indeed, to Carnegie Mellon to, for my PhD. And it turns out that at Carnegie Mellon, I worked very quickly under the uh, protection of Bob Lucas. Bob Lucas, many of you do not know him, probably. But actually, Bob Lucas is really the, a giant. He is really the person who revolutionized macro modern macroeconomics. It, it was ma it's macroeconomics before Bob Lucas and after Bob Lucas. And today, in central banks, for instance, the big models that we use are typically product of what came out of this research program to which I participated, but I'm not going to talk much about, under the heading of Bob Lucas. Bob Lucas was just 1972, that's when I joined Carnegie Mellon, right, I just written a paper that gave him the Nobel Prize. Uh, and uh, very interestingly and quite exceptionally, if you think about it, as a young guy, 23 years old, I was working every week, an hour, with Bob Lucas in his office, discussing what I had discovered, what I worked on during the week. Uh, and that's how I finally wrote my thesis. So that's the end, I guess, with a little exception to what I will say about my own uh, intellectual career. Macroeconomics is general equilibrium. So all along, I've been talking about, and, and, and I've been working out, in this chapter of economics, general equilibrium, and uh, welfare economics. Boring, you are going to say. Why did I come in this room to, to hear this kind of stuff? Well, what's the link with our topic? Well, the, 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 the construction of welfare economics really culminated into two theorems that we, do, we owe to Kenneth Arrow and Gerard Debreu, which are called the welfare theorems. And the welfare theorems tell us that under a set of hypotheses, and I'm going to go not to all of them, but I will focus on one specific one of them. Under a set of hypotheses, the competitive equilibrium of a market economy is efficient. In other words, we can decentralize the economic activity. We can trust market. The outcome is going to be efficient. And in fact, the notion of efficient is associated with the name of Pareto, the same guy that I was talking about the slide before. Pareto optimal. And that's the first theorem. We can't let the market work, and it's going to deliver something. I know when I say that, many of you start to be irritated. They are itchy, right? Why? Defending the market. Well, under hypothesis, right? OK, the second theorem, and I will then go to something a bit more concrete, is saying that if you pick an allocation of resources, that is a way of organizing the economy that you like, we can decentralize it as a market, the very same one, we can implement it as a, in the market system, but of course we need to redistribute resources. The notion of redistribution is very important. Enough abstract theory. Let's go to the concrete stuff. 
a bit arbitrarily, I will extract three lessons from, from welfare economics. The first lesson, the invisible hand, that I know Martin likes a lot. Well, the invisible hand, which is an hypothesis of Adam Smith, is more than an intuition, because the, invisible, the intuition of the invisible hand is that the, mark, the price system can really make align the interest of the private and the interest of the collective. This was a fundamental intuition. Adam Smith was saying, think about the baker. The baker makes good bread. Why does he make good bread? Because he loves me? No. Maybe he does, if it's a nice baker in. But he does it because when he makes very good bread, I'm going to go back and buy his bread. And maybe I'll be willing to pay a little bit more. Right? So the interest of the baker is really aligned with the interest of the consumer. It doesn't always work under hypothesis, but it works many times. Uh, private and collective interests are not necessarily in conflict. If someone, make, make, if someone makes profit, it's not necessarily bad. That's the first idea. Why? Because uh, maybe I'm not I'm searching, in, uh, basically, under the same hypothesis that we are talking about, equilibrium is efficient, and that means that the invisible hand is working. It's the same, the same con context. Second lesson, well, this means, and it's very important, that indeed economic decentralization is possible and legitimate. It's not obvious that each one of you decide every day, totally freely, totally autonomously, what to do. Do you want to go to the lecture? Do you want to go to the beach? Do you want to study this or that? A priori, this should result in chaos. How can we order that? Well, that's, a perfect, that's the, 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 the characteristic of the price system, to make that orderly, to, inc to make that possible. There's going to be an equilibrium result, resulting from that. And this decentralization is possible, and it's legitimate because this is achieved with the objective of maximizing social welfare. And again, under hypothesis, we are, going to we are going to get there. Note, and I put that in parenthesis, that of course, e e economic decentralization is very often a net prerequisite. There's almost a perfect correlation with economic decentralization and political decentralization, which we know in Switzerland is something very important. And we can go further on that. Third lesson, uh, that we have is that prices are precious or important signals. They summarize a wealth of information and we should be very, very careful before we tinker with them. I love this one because that's exactly what the subject of my, my, state, my PhD thesis. I showed in my PhD thesis that in some special market, the futures market, the future for market for future delivery, under the right hypothesis, the price, the equilibrium prices were a sufficient statistics that is contained all the information that was relevant for the decision maker. Okay. No, Hitchi, welfare theorems are just that. They are theorems. They are valid under hypothesis. Okay. Now, that means, in particular, just I'm relieving the itch that the welfare theorem do not legitimate economic laissez-faire. On the contrary, they give a very strong push and a logical argument for a mixed economic system. A system where, uh, where in fact, the state is needed beyond its function as sovereign, beyond the function regalienne. We need the state to make sure that the economy works properly. It has a subsidiary role. We believe that it's better to have the market work first, and if it works, we let it work. But if it doesn't work, that is when the hypotheses are not satisfied, the state should come in because the invisible hand is not going to be working properly. Okay, and capitalism in all that. Well, I must admit, mea culpa, this was a bit of a marketing device, right? Someone told me it's a very nice title. Yes, marketing. Uh, why it's, 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 uh, I'm not going to go deeper into all the various interpretations of capitalism. I take it that I'm going to be talking about 
our system, our economic system, might take today, and I define capitalism as an economy where the regulation of economic activity is prim primarily through competition and subsidiarily by a central authority, the state. It's a mixed economy, okay? We can, over the glass of wine after, discuss other interpretation of capitalism, which is a very loaded word. Let me stick with this, okay? Okay, so that was my introduction. So now, instead of talking about capitalism and the planet, let me talk about the welfare theorems and the planet. Uh, and indeed, key of my message, some of you have seen it, and I'm more, sorry. <laughs> we are living beyond our means. Okay, we are, we are exhausting our poor planet. And this is the uh, observation, this is the picture that I hope many of you have seen, and I pay homage to my visitor from Stockholm. This comes from the Stockholm Resilience Center. Uh, this one dates from January 2022, but it's really in 2009 that the idea uh, uh, came up. And the idea is simply that, you see in green, there is a safe operating space. If we do not produce, consume too much, we will be within the safe operating space. If, however, we start producing too much CO2, for instance, we are going to have a problem with climate change. That's one of the, yeah, that's, that's one direction. The, 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 I mean, CO2 and, and, and climate change is something that we, we talk every day about. What this is saying is that the problem is more serious. The problem is, 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 is in fact, gra more grave. It, it's more serious than, than actually this because it goes also in other direction, notably freshwater use, ocean acidification, uh, biochemical flows, uh, land system use, uh, biodiversity, etc. So we have a problem. Now, for those of you who have never seen this, I go, went back to the definition of Wikipedia. What are the planetary boundaries? It is a framework to describe limits to the impact of human activities on the Earth system. Limits is the green part. Beyond these limits, the environment may not be able to self-regulate anymore. Now, what does that mean? That means that the capacity of the Earth to self-regulate is limited, the green part, and it is a critical resource. It's something that we really need. It's, it's, it's something very important. It's something that has a lot of value. And this resource, we share it with all present and future humans. This is the humanity's common good, the common good of humanity. We need to be very protective of the capacity of the Earth to preserve itself. And if we don't, we have something like climate change and potential extremely severe catastrophes. Now, why didn't I work on this pollution in 1972? Right? I talk about marine oil pollution. Why not CO2? Well, because we didn't know about it. This is a relatively uh, recent phenomenon. And the culprit is population growth. We are much more than we were in 1972. I didn't look at the number, but it's probably on the extent of three to eight, two, three to eight million, certainly more, two, twice as, ma as many. So population growth is the problem. And the other problem is affluence. It's, we are getting richer and richer. And these two things combined means that or what we impose on the planet is, is bigger and bigger, and progressively the planet cannot absorb, cannot re re respond, and regenerate itself, itself in face of what, we, of what we are producing. We have been too slow to recognize it. In 2009, two, two boundaries were crossed, two the six limit had excluded, and in fact, the very new picture, September 2023, is this one. We, we do have three areas where we are still in the green, all the, the other one we are in the red, and we are even in the dark red. We are really, it's a real, real, real problem. Planetary boundaries, this is a game changer. It's a game changer because for the first time, precious and scarce resources cannot be managed by the market. Cannot be managed by the market. Why? Because there are no markets. One of the key hypotheses of the welfare theorems is that in order for the competitive equilibrium to be efficient, 
you need to have a market for each important resources. Here we have many important resources for which there is no market. The logic, I think, is impe impeccable. We can discuss it, but the market system can deliver if there is market. If there is no market, it could not. That's simply an impossibility. And there are no markets because there are no corresponding property rights. Right? The property, the owner of the resources is humanity itself, including unborn generation, and they are not there to uh, make sure that we respect this resource, that we manage it correctly. No markets are no market for the ability of the environment to, to, the environment to self regulate, uh, no market for the capacity of the planet to absorb the CO2 emitted by humans without warming. No, each of these outside of the boundary represent a resource that is extremely important for which there is no market. That means, ah, feeling better, that the legitimacy of the market system is in question. Right? In the absence of markets, the welfare theorems, the theorems, it's not pure intuition, the theorems tell us that the invisible hand is not going to work. Prices do not correctly reflect relative scarcities, the prices are giving the wrong signals. And of course, that's what we are seeing every day, right? We, 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 we fly to Barcelona for 30 francs. This is the wrong signal. The true price is not included. Uh, the true cost is not included in the price. And of course, I'm just taking an example by, by randomly, but I could take many, many more. And that means, this is the lesson of the welfare theorems, we need collective intervention. We cannot decentralize in that case. We need the collective, we need the state. To correct prices, ideally, that would be the best, correcting prices, inserting taxes, price correction, to make sure that the ref prices reflect true cost, or take alternative measure when the people don't want it, alternative measure to try to reach the same goal and manage co the common good properly. Okay, what does that mean? That means that we, have in front, we are confronted with a number of challenges. The first one are systemic challenges. We need to preserve our common natural capital. It did require the state, this requires require more state. The market cannot do it. At the same time, and that has been emphasized by, by Martin at the beginning, we need technology, we need innovation. We need to develop clean technology. We need to develop circular models. Uh, otherwise, the kind of behavioral changes that are necessary will simply, are simply unimaginable. And looking at history, there is a tension. That's typically the innovation comes from individual decentralized ingenuity, not rarely it comes from the state. So what are we going to do? I don't know. We have prob uh, prop propositions in, in, in at, at E4S, but I'm going to stay, stick with the challenge. The first challenge is that we have to maintain our capacity to innovate with a large state footprint. There is a second one that I'm not going to insist on, but I think it's particularly interesting, important. Why is that the second challenge is because the commons is at the planetary level. I know we know a little bit how to manage the commons at the regional or local level. At the planetary level, that's something completely different. And I'm alluding here to another Nobel Prize winner who, who worked on the uh, provisioning of water in the in valley. Hmm? But, uh, so managing the commons at the planetary level is extremely demanding. Ideally, it's at the multilateral level. It's in Geneva and New York and in the United Nations that we should do that. And we know that today we have little hope that we are going to find the solution quickly out of these instances. So what does that mean? That means that the continents are more important. It is at the level of Europe, and hopefully the United States as well, let's pray, that we are going to find a solution. And this is a situation that is very in uncomfortable for a small country like Switzerland. So I put on here my, my little note, our relation to Europe is more important than we think in this new world. We have challenges also at the microeconomic level. Uh, and let me talk about the firm first. In a world of externalities and missing markets, uh, the legitimacy of maximizing shareholder value or profit disappears. Friedman, our good old friend, is exactly in the same category. 
if the hypotheses of the welfare theorem are satisfied, Friedman is right. The firm can simply maximize profit. We are now in a situation where the hypotheses are not satisfied, Legit maximizing shareholder value is not legitimate, profit, maximizing profit is not legitimate, profit return may conflict with the common good. We must expect something, from, something, el something else from firms. Responsible corporates, these are the logical foundation of corporate social responsibility. And, you know, we start to know one another quite well with Martin. So here is the picture. Here is the picture of these people who are along the campfire with the planet destroyed in the background. And these little people say, yes, the planet got destroyed for a beautiful moment in time. We created, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of values for shareholders. Very nice, very fun, very powerful, in fact, very deep. Because this picture tells us simply business as usual is not an option. And the message goes to everyone, not only to a corporation. Business as usual is not an option for politicians either. Yes, the planet got destroyed for a beautiful moment, but in time, uh, we had a great string of successful, for a beautiful moment in time, we had a great string of successful re-elections. Now, I have to be fair to all the members of the panel, right? So let me, do it for central bankers, right? <laughs> yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we perfectly fulfilled our price stability mandate. <laughs> uh, and should be my mea culpa. There is a dilemma for researchers as well. There are some researchers in the room. Yes, the planet got destroyed. But for a beautiful moment in time, we had great publication successes in leading academic journals. So, what, do we have? what are we? We have microeconomic challenges. We need responsible corporate, we need responsible consumer, we need responsible everyone. This is a much more complicated world, full of moral dilemmas. Profit return may conflict with the common good. Fun, comfort, personal satisfaction may be conflict with the common good. Doing well while doing good is the Graal. And we should try to do that. That is to make money by doing good but it's an illusion to believe that it will always be possible if prices are not correctly reflecting true scarcities. Okay, that's why we did E4S. Okay, the goal of E4S is really in this, the motivation for E4S is what I have mentioned. We have a much more complicated world, full of moral dilemmas, we need guidance, and we need to get together, IMD, APFL, UNIL, to try to think about it, if you have, and to try to inspire and activate the transition to a resilient and inclusive economy within planetary boundaries, mindful of the opportunities and challenges raised by scientific and technological challenge. Let me go to the third part. Okay, I'll go five minutes, that's not possible. Right? We re re recharge the clock. An impossible marriage. I go to the last part of my title, uh, do we need a system change or a change in the system? Uh, is a happy marriage possible? Well, of course, uh, these guys here in the street of Lausanne, they really think, no, we need to change the system, not the climate, and I, I, I fully agree. Okay, let's, we need to change the system, not the climate. But what do we mean by changing the system? Well, let's think about what is our system? What is our very adaptable system? It's a mixed economy in which the state controls or should control the essential commons. It's a demo we live in democracy, so we mean that the state is us. So when you think about fundamentally, where are we? What is our system? We, the people, have all the elements in hand to initiate the changes that are necessary and meet the challenges we face. Of course, the majority has to be convinced. Now, Theory, right? This is theory. Indeed, it's theory, but it's sound theory. And my vision is that actually making the system work properly, which is what it is about, is probably within closer reach than agreeing democratically on a system change. 
So what do we need to make the system work properly? We need a better democracy. Now, I know you could question exactly the terminology, and you will see what I mean by that. Uh, we need, in fact, a state that plays its role. A state that is more assertive. If the hypotheses of my theorems are not satisfied, we need the state. We are exceeding planetary boundaries, we need more state. And for that, of course, we need a state that is less captured by private interest and a state that is smarter. Now, that's easy to say, and I don't have time left. So I will only go a very specific line uh, on what would that mean by a state that is smarter. Well, it's a state that would recognize that fighting for one's interest or the interest of one's group uh, is human. It's human but it is not legitimate when designing institution. So it's at the level of designing institution that we should be smarter, and we should follow John Rawls. We should conceive of a system, of our system, behind the veil of ignorance. That is putting aside our personal interest. Nice to say, well, that means essentially that we should follow Ulysses. I remember Ulysses, trying to cross the Detroit of Messina and aware of the fact that the sirens were going to be there and that it would be in, in, in the impossibility to, resi to resist the song of the sirens. So what did Ulysses do? What Ulysses do, did is he had his companion tie him up against the map, the mast. Okay? So he started, he cannot resist the sirens, but he cannot move. So he will be able to conduct his, 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 his bark, his, his, his boat, in the, in the right direction. This is not theory. It's not only history, Omer. It's not only theory. And in fact, one of my co-advisors uh, got a Nobel Prize on economics for that. It's called rules rather than discretion. But on top of that, it has been applied in the central banking world. A random example that I'm taking here. This is the central bank. This is the macroeconomic environment. Who are the sirens? The politicians. They want the central bank to do something special, to make them increase the probability of re-election, and the interest groups. And where is Thomas? He's right there. He's along the bust. Okay? And he is constrained by a mandate. Okay, is constrained by a mandate, and that is in fact what we have designed for central bank independence, which is a, an anomaly in democracy. But it's the an anomaly. Why? Because the lever of what is arguably the most powerful economic instrument is taken away from the parliament, from the democratic arena, and it ended out to a few technocrats. Technocrats by design, because we want them to be isolated from the pressure of interest groups. But we give them a specific mandate, mandate, and they are accountable. If they don't do well, we cut their head or we kick them out. Okay? Now, I say it's an anomaly. We could even think it's an exception. It should not be. It should be a model. We should get inspired by this example. And indeed, we know that this has been uh, extended to the fiscal arena. We have some, in some country a fiscal board. In a sense, the notion of the debt break rule that we had implemented in Switzerland very successfully is an example of that. Maybe not the best, but it's one. And I would even introduce the notion that when we think about these assemblies citoyennes, I cannot, we, 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 we might be going in the same direction, the same, in the same uh, direction of thinking. So, now I conclude. <laughs> Good. I conclude, uh, we are navigating a more complex world. So the advertising minute, E4S is here to help. Why don't you help E4S? <laughs> and we need a revivified democracy. Again, I'm not sure that I told, would not change the, the, the terminology. What I mean by that, we need a stronger state. We need a smarter state. We need lobby being kept at bay. And basically, we should take account of the fact that when the challenges get larger, the institution must be made stronger, and then they must be adapted behind the veil of ignorance to the new challenges. And that means we are really pushing the fact that we have a fantastic democracy in Switzerland. It is true, 
but it should be readapted, adapted again to the new challenges, and I think we need to do better. Now, I don't want to really conclude without uh, providing you with uh, the picture of a happy marriage. Picture of a happy marriage, and with, of course, uh, taking advantage of this to pay tribute to the lady on the right, who is also the lady here on in front, who has been uh, with me uh, over this whole academic parcours, 51 years together, if I count my PhD study. 51 years. <laughs> yeah. And this trip would have been much less enjoyable without her, but also it would have been much less impregnated with humanistic values, and I owe her that. <laughs> Final question, can we have such a happy marriage between capitalism and the planet? And I hope so, but we have to work on it. Yes, if it is blessed by a stronger democracy and a more assertive state. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> okay, now we go to the round table. Ah, no, not true. I'm sorry. I, I should sit down. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Jean-Pierre, for your uh, delightful speech. Um, my name is Rüdiger Fahnbach. I'm the director of the College of Management at EPFL. The College of Management was the academic home of Jean-Pierre as a professor here at EPFL while he founded E4S. He was also the co-director of the College of Management. And as you can see, being a director of the College of Management is a dangerous job. <laughs> I met Jean-Pierre pretty much 20 years ago. I was a freshly minted PhD student coming to Lausanne to APFL to look for a job. Jean-Pierre was in the middle of what I would call his first professional life. He was a renowned macroeconomist, think big picture, and a financial economist. He was at the University of Lausanne, yet I was looking for a job at APFL and I talked to him. Why? Because the College of Management at APFL did not exist yet. And Jean-Pierre, being the helpful person he is, decided to help the EPFL to find um, a professor in finance. Now, at the time, um, despite Jean-Pierre being the charismatic and convincing person that he is, he was already at that point, I decided to stay in the US. So why am I talking to you now? Because I talked to Jean-Pierre again. Uh -huh. So in, several years later, we talked, and he convinced me that Lausanne and APFL is really the only place in the world where I would be happy. <laughs> and so, perhaps for those of you who have interacted with Jean-Pierre before, you find a certain threat here. If you are very concentrated and um, very focused, you can say no to him once. But he is not somebody who gives up easily. So he will talk to you again, he will be convincing, he will share his vision and ambition to, with you, and you say, how could I say no the first time? Of course, yes, I will do that. So, when um, in 2003, when we first met, Jean-Pierre was already a renowned macroeconomist. He has made fundamental contributions to asset pricing, to hedging with futures, and to long-run macroeconomic models. He had also written a very influential textbook, Intermediate Financial Theory, that he cleverly placed at a, in a space 
where there was not really a textbook. It was a bit more than what MBA students could typically digest, and it was for PhD student not only the math, but also the big picture, the macroeconomics of it. And so he wrote this book with this longtime co-author, John Donaldson, and here, instead of trying the impossible task to summarize to you in five minutes the theoretical contributions to macroeconomics and finance in a lifetime, I reached out to John Donaldson, his um, former, um, or his former co-author and friend, to ask him to share a couple of words about Jean-Pierre and um, how he is as a researcher. So this is what um, John Donaldson wrote to me. Jean-Pierre and I have worked together for 40 years, and we are in the midst of a new project even now. Over that time span, I have learned a lot of macroeconomics from him, and more importantly, I have learned what research efforts should emphasize and be directed towards. He has been unfailingly generous with his time. Indeed, it could not be possible to find a better collaborator. More importantly, Jean-Pierre is an unfailing advocate for the well-balanced life. He is very wise in his assessments of people and events, and even wiser in his assessment what is truly important. Among other things, lots of vacations with family. I regard him as a friend and thank him for his patience and generosity of time and spirit over the many years we have worked together. I wish somebody would say this at the end of the career about working with me. Um, now, a distinguishing characteristic of Jean-Pierre was, how, however, very evident in 2003 already. He is not a very good scholar, but he's also an institution builder. So by the time, he had already been vice rector of the University of Lausanne. He had been the department chair of the Department of Economics and the Department of Finance and had created here in the Lake Geneva area a center, and the center's name was Center for Financial Asset Management and Engineering, with the pretty cool acronym FAME. Now, FAME ran executive education and PhD courses. Now, Jean-Pierre was not only the director of FAME, but then decided that this local initiative would um, be much more impactful if he could extend this to the um, Switzerland at large. So he founded the Swiss Finance Institute because he had the fundamental belief that in a country with such an important financial center, we would need to have support for finance research and for education. And today, the Swiss Finance Institute supports some 75 researchers across the top Swiss universities and contributes to education and competitiveness of the financial, Swiss Financial Center. Now, Erwan Morelek, um, his long-term colleague and friend um, who worked with Jean-Pierre at the time, I asked him about that uh, those days, and he wrote to me, I was always impressed by Jean-Pierre's ability to develop a vision and never lose track of it. And I remember his calm and determination in the many meetings necessary to execute that vision. Let me get to what I would call Jean-Pierre's second professional life. What happens if you are a renowned macroeconomist and you have shown that you can build institution? You can become a top contender for jobs outside of the university. And indeed, in 2010, Jean-Pierre became a member of the directorate of the Swiss National Bank. Now, however, to make this a reality, Jean-Pierre faced the biggest challenge of his professional life. He needed to learn German, <laughs> something that almost broke his spirit. <laughs> so to honor his efforts in 2010, I will continue my speech of Deutsch. <laughs> no, perhaps not. Um, Jean-Pierre joined the Swiss National Bank in a difficult economic environment. When I came to Switzerland in 2009, the, euro was, the one euro was worth 1.5 francs. By mid-2011, one euro only purchased 1.18 Swiss francs. The franc had massively appreciated, and the expectation was that the franc would appreciate even further. The strong franc presented extraordinary challenges for the Swiss economy that depends so much on exports and tourism. Fewer people could afford a vacation in Switzerland, and companies and people abroad were more reluctant to purchase Swiss products at these unfavorable exchange rates. 
The appreciation of the Swiss franc forced the directorate of the Swiss National Bank to take drastic, never before seen measures. The SNB introduced a minimum exchange rate of 1.2 francs per euro on September 6, 2011, and said that it would, prepare, would be prepared to buy foreign currency in unlimited quantities to defend the minimum exchange rate with the utmost determination. To me, that statement is on par with Mario Draghi's form of famous whatever it takes. The bold decision of the SNB led to a stabilization of the situation, gave Swiss companies the time to adjust their cost structure, and was really instrumental in steering the Swiss economy through turbulent times. Jean-Pierre retired from the Swiss National Bank in 2015 when he reached the mandatory retirement age. Now, at a stage in life when regular, normal people think about where to purchase their chalet, Jean-Pierre could not quite imagine exchanging laptop and economics for hiking boots and mountains. He started what I would like to call his third professional life. He became president of the Paris School of Economics, joined several foundations as trustee, and of course, because that was not quite enough to fill the day, he came to APFL and, helped to, and, and decided to help create the Enterprise for Society Center. Now, in his remarks, Martin already pointed out how far E4S has come. So let me just reiterate the mission of E4S because it really speaks for itself. The mission of E4S is to inspire and activate the transition to a resilient and inclusive economy within planetary boundaries, mindful of the opportunities and challenges raised by scientific and technological change. And it was really fascinating to see how Jean-Pierre lived that vision and built the center. So I also reached out to people from E4S, but there were so many positive things that I, it would be impossible for me to say these in these 10 minutes. So nobody brought forward something critical, so let me say something critical as a German about E4S. At events of E4S, there's too much focus on Belgian beer. There are other nations that do good beer. Um. <laughs> now, Jean-Pierre, it, it was a pleasure and a privilege to have known and interacted with you for part of your journey here at APFL and the College of Management. Thank you for everything that you have done for EPFL, for the Swiss finance community, and really Switzerland at large. Thank you. If I could ask uh, Martin and Jean-Pierre on stage, please. So let me read the dedication. C'est le diplôme, ça va être en français. On va faire un peu de français après l'allemand. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Donc, euh, le titre de professeur honoraire délivré par le PFL à Monsieur le professeur Jean-Pierre Dantine, en témoignage de reconnaissance et d'admiration pour ses contributions exceptionnelles à la recherche en économie et en finance, au pilotage de l'économie suisse en tant que vice-président de la Banque nationale lors de la période éminemment complexe de la crise de 2008, ainsi qu'au travers de la création du centre interdisciplinaire E4S, devenu un acteur incontournable dans les réflexions et la mise en place d'une économie plus durable et plus résiliente. Sa capacité rare à faire naître des projets collectifs, son énergie incroyable et sa créativité qui ont fait honneur à l'EPFL et à toute la place académique romande. Merci beaucoup Jean-Pierre.
let's go. <laughs> Time to work. All right, time to work, as you said. Um, delighted to be moderating this conversation. You put a lot in front of us, uh, and so I'm excited to get some reactions and some thoughts from our panelists. But I'd like to start by highlighting that we will have some time for questions from you. In fact, uh, with uh, Swiss Precision, we've agreed on three questions from the audience, so you can uh, submit a question if you like. I'll be getting those questions and I'll choose three questions. Um, but um, our panelists, of course, uh, uh, will uh, stick around uh, for a bit. And so if you have a particularly burning question you'd like to address that we do not get to, perhaps you can ask in, in private at the end of the conversation. So, um, Noleg, I'd like to start with you if I can. Um, you are Chief Sustainability Officer at Wholesome. And Jean-Pierre has spoken about um, a uh, current state of the world, uh, a market system that because of pervasive externalities, other sources of market failures is one where it isn't in your turn, I think in your words, it isn't legitimate for us to focus on profit maximization. Is that how you think about it as well at, at Wholesome? Great question. Uh, thank you, David. I would like to start by, first of all, congratulating uh, Jean-Pierre for uh, the amazing legacy he has created with Enterprise for Society. I think working at the crossroads of technology, sustainability, and putting business to work to advance those two areas to make it a prosperous business model was absolutely visionary. Uh, if I look at Wholesome today, so Wholesome uh, is the largest the building materials company in the world. And we are what you call a hard to abate sector um, because we need to decarbonize and as fast as possible. What is driving our transformation to decarbonize is precisely what you described, Jean-Pierre. It's putting our innovation to work to drive sustainable building solutions. And as we do that, lead a prosperous and profitable business model. We're actually doing that today, and uh, we're at the forefront of launching the most, uh, the broadest ranges of low carbon concrete, for instance, Ecopact. We launched it three years ago. Today it represents close to 20% of our sales in that area. And so we are demonstrating that green growth can be profitable growth. And that is really the ethos of the transformation that we're on at Wholesome, to make those three dimensions work together to make that marriage a happy marriage. Um, and I just want to raise another point that you, that you brought up today with the planetary boundaries. Because in our world, circular construction is the next frontier. It is gonna be a game changer for us. Uh, and integrating nature and biodiversity into the equation is increasingly important beyond CO2. Uh, I just came back from New York Climate Week and we were part of the launch of the very first task force for financial disclosures on nature that was launched at New York Stock Exchange last week. Today in the world, 85% of companies have climate targets, 25% have water targets, but only 5% of companies have biodiversity and nature targets. Um, and I think the more we can embed biodiversity and nature as well in our sustainability transitions, the more we can grow within our planetary boundaries. And for that, I think circular economy is gonna play a vital role. Thank you so much. Uh, Isabel, if I, if I may turn to you. Um, it doesn't happen all the time that economists speak about a more assertive state, wanting more state. So, so you represent uh, the state, you represent uh, government, uh, you're here as, a, as an elected official. So I suppose this call for more state must resonate. It means a greater role for you and your colleagues. But at the same time, I know that um, as, a, as a member of the, of the Liberal Radical Party, you have some concerns about this more assertive state, too much government policy. So, so where do you stand? How do you respond to Jean-Pierre's call for this more assertive and smarter state? So as you said, I'm a liberal man, so I'm not for more state. But I like the statement that we have to have a more smarter state. And, and if I can answer to, to the first question about capitalism and, uh, uh, and the planet, an impossible marriage or not, and I will say, no, it's not an impossible marriage. It has to be a possible marriage. And the state has to do that it will be a 
marriage that functions. Um, why? Um, I'm in favor of a sustainable growth. It means, I have to read it in English, that is a growth within <coughs> planetary limits. Um, une croissance dura durable, I mean a growth, not degrowth, une croissance durable, une croissance qui s'inscrit dans les limites planétaires. Est-ce que je peux raconter l'anecdote um, I'm in charge for one year now, and we were preparing the program of my department and uh, with a lot of people from here too, and we were discussing with Jean-Pierre, and uh, I was telling him in my program, I want um, the statement that I'm in favor of a, uh, of a sustainable growth. And uh, concrete, I want to describe it. And Jean-Pierre said, Une croissance durable, c'est une croissance qui s'inscrit dans les limites planétaires. And I said, ah, oh, you have to do politics. I like your statement. Yeah. I want to <laughs> borrow your words. And he said, be my guest. <laughs> so now, in the program of the Canton de Vaud, in the program of our government for the four next years, it's written that we are for a sustainable growth with some points of Jean-Pierre for the economy. Why, actually, uh, the state has to provide the, um, the framework, the um, attractive business environment for the firms, and one of the condition is sustainability. And we had it in our program. Uh, we have, for example, a, a lot of funds to help uh, the firms to do this transition for more sustainability. Wonderful, thank you. Um, of course, you're not the only representative of the state, uh, Thomas, you're, you're here as well, and, and you represent an institution that is, that is dear to Jean-Pierre's heart, not only because he spent time there, but I think he spoke passionately about uh, the sort of, um, the strength of the design, and, and arguably independent central banks are an anomaly, and so I guess my question for you really is, if, if they are a model that could provide some of that more assertive role of the state. Why have we not seen that model of technocratic independent leadership elsewhere? What is it about monetary policy perhaps that lends itself to it and, and where else could you see a model like this applied? Well, let me first congratulate uh, Jean-Pierre for this brilliant lecture. If also to say uh, Jean-Pierre was really an exceptional colleague and he contributed over many years to really the quality of the Swiss uh, monetary policy. So Thank thanks again, Jean-Pierre, for this really good time at the Swiss National Bank. Well, I see the argument uh, uh, of Jean-Pierre regarding these uh, independent institutions, uh, and uh, very glad that he took the uh, Central Bank as a, as a role model here. I'm, I have to say I'm a little bit more skeptical whether this really works now for uh, the climate or for other things. For monetary policy, it's relatively straightforward to give a mandate to an independent central bank. I would say probably the vast majority of the Swiss population agrees that price stability is extremely important. We could win every votation on that. I think it would be much more difficult to find an explicit mandate regarding the climate to give that to an independent uh, institution. But it goes beyond that. What are the instruments? So for central banks, it's relatively easy. So we have the in interest rate, we have uh, for an exchange intervention, we have the balance sheet. But what are then the, uh, the instrument that this independent organization can use? Can they decide whether you can go on vacation, whether you can fly or eat, whether we stop immediately with something? So I think the, 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 the agreement on the uh, toolkit on the instruments would be very, very, uh, very, very difficult. And I think that there would be hard to find an agreement on that. And then also Jean-Pierre mentioned accountability. So for monetary policy, when we take our decisions, usually the impact on those decisions, of those decisions on the, um, uh, on price stability or the economy is something that is within a time frame, maybe one to five, maybe one to three years. Here it's completely different. So I think it, it will be very hard to provide accountability. So my guess is it is very hard to take that away from government and parliament. These are so, so far-reaching uh, far -reaching decisions that giving them to an independent institution may be very difficult. We had it already, Jean-Pierre, when we discussed about macroprudential tools. 
something much more difficult when the central bank would decide who can buy a house where do you have to afford 7 or 10 percent interest rate on your mortgage otherwise you cannot buy a house these are decisions that are really going into let's say the personal life uh, planning and etc uh, etc et and it becomes very difficult then to argue that an independent central bank technocratic institution can then decide about those things thank you Jean-Pierre, I know that you've been thinking about this quite a bit. You'd like to respond to what you heard? Uh, no, uh, well, uh, just late, lately on the last uh, remark of Thomas, I fully agree. I mean, this is, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's an inspiration at a broad level. I mean, we need to think about decreasing the power of lobbies, extracting private interest, uh, having, making sure that private interests have less possibility to influence decision at the very last stage of the decision. And that's why I'm thinking about, rethinking about the designing of institution. Now, my example, of course, was chosen because I needed to have a specific example, but my, the fact that I call about Assembly Citoyenne between, between being possibly a way to think about that, uh, suggests that I think totally right, we have to enlarge that, but clearly uh, designing institution with anticipation of the fact that at some stage, private interests are going to be so powerful that they are going to distort what we want to do is, is something that we need to think more about uh, when uh, looking at the problems we are facing with. Since I have the floor, I'd like to ask a question maybe to, to, to the two of you, uh, Isabel and, and Oleg. What do you have to say? What can you say to the people in the room here who are really impatient? They think things are going too slow. We are knowing not going to reach the goal. Maybe no leg. Thank you, Jean-Pierre, for that essential question. And that was actually the call to action from uh, Antonio Gutierrez in New York last week. How can we go faster? How can we speed things up? Um, in our case, in the building sector, it requires collaborating across the entire value chain of the building uh, construction sector, from public authorities setting the building norms, to architects and designers to embed uh, more low carbon and sustainable systems in their designs, real estate developers, our customers, and ourselves to innovate. So what we are doing is we are mobilizing the entire value chain to try to move faster together. Uh, it takes a systems-based approach to do this. It takes a lot of collaboration. It takes all of us stepping out of our comfort zones to do that. Um, one of the big catalysts that helps us go faster is when uh, the state puts in place progressive regulatory norms. Um, I'm going to give the example I was going to share that I shared with David earlier. Uh, in Switzerland, for instance, um, the Zurich uh, Canton and authorities imposed uh, the, a in a mandatory way to put 20% of recycled construction demolition materials into the formulation of all the cement that went into their public works. So it gave a constraint to our teams to innovate, to develop uh, a cement that had 20% recycled content inside. And we actually launched the world's first cement with 20% recycled construction demolition materials inside. We've been taking that innovation now around the world. It took us four years by making the EU instances aware of this possibility uh, to now make it possible within the EU. And now we're even bringing it to Mexico. So as our markets get on board what innovation can do today, what's possible with our technologies, what's possible when you go circular, um, the prompt of that was a regulatory building norm that made it mandatory for us to do this. Uh, we're able to scale things up faster. So I think having a smart norm speeds things up. Isabel, the question for you also, it's terrific that planetary boundaries are part of the statement around sustainable growth. How do we move faster? To, to answer the question of you, Jean-Pierre, um, just before, you talked about democracy. In Switzerland, it's not only the government and the parliament who decides. <laughs> it's the people, they vote. And uh, if I look at the last votation, uh, they didn't want to change the quality of life and they didn't want to pay more taxes. Um, we had a big votation for the last um, a CO2 um, 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 decision, so it was four or five years ago. I was fighting for, uh, for a yes and we lose because the people said, no, we don't want more taxes. Mm -hmm. So you cannot only, um, with your um, strong state, take some decisions. After that, people have to say a yes. And it's not 
always possible. So um, my solution is more with a smarter state, as you say, to change the framework uh, with the condition of sustainability. Uh, and in that framework, um, the quality of life of people doesn't change and uh, they do not pay more taxes. Uh, so, so or they do not know that are paying taxing for okay. that. Uh, let it say like that because no, everything costs. Um, and uh, how can we do it with innovation, for example? Uh, I think this is really a solution, innovation, and it's not the state who can do innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, we can put the frameworks and the firms, uh, private business has to be innovating, uh, and we can help. How can we help? We can help with our universities, with EPFL, and uh, with uh, uh, E4S, for example. Um, Thank you. <laughs> things like that. And what we have in the Canton de Vaux, um, I will talk about my four funds with 200 millions. We have a fund for uh, innovation with 100 million because uh, we think we have to focus on innovation. We have a fund for sustainable economy with 25 million. The idea is here, big companies, they know they have to do something with sustainability. They know that once it will cost a lot and uh, they know that they have to invest. But uh, little firms, they know, but they don't know how to do it. They do not have the money. So this fund is made for them to help them for this transition for more sustainability. And we have an industrial fund, 20 million, because we, ha we want to have uh, industry in the Canton Vaux. It's important to have diversity in our economy. And our uh, last example, we have a credit for sustainable tourism is 50 million. This is made for all tourism in the canton, but especially for the Alps, to have an all-year tourism. And with 200 million, we can quite help a lot. Thank so you. it's framework, it's support, it's investment. Um, you know, like one of the things that uh, Jean-Pierre said during his talk, and he came back to it in his brief statement, is you know, we have to break the power of lobbies. Uh, and at the same time, you spoke of a systems approach, and a systems approach implies that business and government and civil society have to sit together. And you know, there are people in the room, whenever they hear business leaders sitting down with government officials and talking about frameworks, they think you know, the, the fix is already in. So how do you um, address that concern of, of too much private uh, and too much business influence and policy, and at the same time, um, achieve this sort of systems change that can only come from collaboration. What must business do to create confidence that you really are working on behalf of the common good rather than thinking about the bottom line? I think it's partnership. And uh, right now, in our decarbonization as a hard to abate sector, we need to partner at an unprecedented level uh, across sectors. I'm going to give the example of carbon capture, utilization, and storage, because in Wholesome's decarbonization roadmap to get to net zero, <coughs> about 40% of our decarbonization will rely on these technologies. Um, and how are we doing this? We need to partner with companies that can capture the CO2 in our plants. We need to partner with companies that can transport it. We need to get permits to do all of this. We need to then either reutilize the CO2 in new applications. Then we have to find people to develop these systems with us and to actually use it. I'm going to give the example of Germany. In Germany, we have in Lagodorf a project where we capture the CO2 from our plant uh, and we transform it with hydrogen into e-methanol that gets used as a sustainable aviation fuel by Lufthansa. We have a similar project in France with Air France, and we have a number of different projects around the world that are quite similar. This requires collaborating with government at local level, at the municipal level, at the national level, and all the way to the EU level to put in place this entire new framework of carbon accounting, uh, you know, carbon management, but also all the new norms that this involves from the transportation to the storage, to the UE utilization. It's a whole new industrial blueprint that we're creating right now. And the only way to do this is by sitting down all together around the table and, and finding the, defining the new rules together. And I think it goes back to having a smart, pragmatic approach and taking a partnership uh, position on this because we can't do this alone. We have to do it together. And do you understand the concern, though? I mean, are there ways that business can be more transparent, make itself more accountable in the way it influences government? Because so often, you know, what business leaders are trying to do, particularly around sustainability, really is to put in place 
the frameworks to create the conditions. But you know, there's a lot of cynicism. People are suspicious of business having outsized influence and in policy. What can you do to reassure? I would say we're very transparent in what we do. So I think basically acting as a good corporate citizen, being transparent, engaging with all our constituents, all of our stakeholders. Um, for instance, we decided at Wholesome to uh, give a say on climate to all of our shareholders. We're the only company in our sector who has done this. So we've done it for the second year in a row now. Uh, we have an open dialogue with all of our stakeholders on this topic. So we, we engage in an open and transparent dialogue on this. Thank you. Um, Thomas. Isabel spoke about 200 million. That's a lot of money. You have a bit more than that, <laughs> still. Um, and, and we need it. So, um, jokes aside, the, the, um, I think the emergence of capital markets of, as, as a real player in accelerating the transition to a low carbon economy uh, has been one of the things that has given a lot of folks hope. Their concerns about ESG standards, a lot of greenwashing, but, but it's much harder to do this without capital markets. So why doesn't the Swiss National Bank use its portfolio uh, more to save the planet? Well, this is, a, I think, a very interesting and important question, but let me just say one point. I, I really believe, and uh, that was at the core of uh, Jean-Pierre's uh, um, presentation before, lecture before, I think we should use the price signals as much as we can. So this, uh, the system, the capitalist system, functions as long as we can ensure that prices reflect scarcity. And uh, I think we, we do not really operate that. We do not really implement it. And we may create a huge bureaucracy with little impact as long as we do not really change these relative prices. So we are discussing about the carbon tax globally. In most places, we have carbon subsidies and not carbon uh, taxes. So I think this is really, when we would like to make a, a big step forward, we have to uh, really change these relative prices. Otherwise, it will be very difficult. And then uh, firms automatically have to react to that. Let me come back now to the, uh, the Swiss National Bank. I think it's very important to realize the uh, really the only key contribution of the Swiss National Bank to the... Uh, uh, to the sustainability of the Switzerland is by providing price stability. There we have the instruments, there we have the mandate, and we should not put at risk that we cannot provide or deliver on price stability. When we have price stability, we give the opportunity to the government, to the firms, to do their job. When we try to achieve something where we do not have the instruments, where we do not have the legitimacy, and we put at risk price stability, we will do just the opposite of what we should do. So price stability is really the key contribution and everybody else can build on that. I think we should not forget. Now, you, you mentioned uh, that the portfolio. I think here, our balance sheet or the portfolio should support the monetary policy of, of, uh, of the Swiss National Bank. We should be able to expand the balance sheet, shrink the balance sheet to very small, to very big, etc. And you have to maintain the value of this, uh, of this portfolio. But when we suddenly try to achieve something else with this uh, portfolio, first of all, I think it's very questionable whether we have an impact uh, at all. And we really put at risk uh, uh, that uh, we get into a conflict of interest and suddenly we may achieve another goal instead of the, the one where we have the mandate. And finally, and this was also maybe uh, Jean-Pierre's point about this uh, independence, we put at risk independence uh, when suddenly people say, well, you do not have uh, the mandate for that, you should not do that, then we finally end up with a very difficult uh, situation. So it's really, and here I'm very much convinced that it's very important that we have a narrow mandate, that we'll deliver on the mandate, and that we do not put at risk the achievements of the Swiss National Bank regarding price stability and all its positive contribution. I think this is very, uh, very important. Let me just finish by that. I think we, we have a very intelligent um, uh, investment uh, uh, policy here. And we have these, uh, also these uh, exclusion restrictions. So we do not invest in firms that do not uh, respect human rights, that do destroy uh, the, the environment, including uh, the climate. So for example, we do not invest in firms that produce uh, thermic coil. And we do not invest in firms that produce uh, non-accepted we weapons by the international community. But here it's really 
these are firms that do not share the Swiss values. So we do not believe that by excluding them, we can really change the world. I think that that is not uh, where, where, it, uh, where we believe in that, but, but we see this is not part of the Swiss values, so we exclude them from our investment uh, universe. And we are in a way pioneer on that. We did start it at many, many years uh, ago, and this is very, very consequential. And the balance sheet was very big. It's now already 20% smaller. And if everything goes well, it becomes smaller again. So I think we should not bet on that portfolio to save the planet. It's really what we heard before. It's the government by having, I think, the, the, the clear relative prices, by taxing the right things, and by having a smart regulation giving the right incentives. Thank you. You're smiling because you know where, go where I'm going next. Jean-Pierre, you are just as committed to price stability but you think there is more that the Swiss National Bank could do, is that right? Well, <laughs> that's a difficult, I told you. I think we should, I mean, the fact is that uh, I, I totally subscribe to the view of Thomas that uh, the, the protecting the mandate is, is absolutely important. Uh, there is one part of the institution of the Swiss National Bank, which is the Conseil de Banque, which is supposed to be part of the protection if the Conseil, if the Swiss National Bank wanted to be more uh, uh, innovative, more, more, more daring in some domain. And so I wonder whether uh, indeed uh, one should not review a little bit the activity of the Conseil de Banque, notably it, the responsibility that it would, have, it would have on investment. And in a sense, that would protect the technocrats, that is the, 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 the monetary policy decision, while making it possible for the Swiss National Bank to the extent that there is a majority in the Conseil de Banque and probably a mandate by the Conseil Federal to be a bit more uh, daring on, in, the, in the investment policy. Please. Well, <laughs> I, I believe, well, I do not fully share your view, Jean-Pierre, I think the, the uh, the uh, council, the bank council is a supervisory authority, but the uh, portfolio is really part of monetary policy, including uh, the investment decision and uh, how we allocate funds. I think this is part of, of monetary policy, and that was always the understanding uh, of, of that, and the, the bank council is really the supervisory authority. But we should also look at the portfolio. Um, I have to say, we will be very transparent in the next sustainability report. We will uh, put all these uh, climate metrics so you can exactly see how much uh, carbon is behind those in, in investments. You can see whether these metrics are very informative or less informative. Uh, but, but we looked uh, and, and we compared that to other central banks. What we will be the most uh, uh, transparent central bank of all, but where we can compare our footprint is roughly in the same magnitude. But we also made an experiment when we said, well, we go out of all private act, uh, assets. Uh, we put everything in very traditional uh, government bonds. And T footprint is even bigger. So it, it just tells you that it, it is, uh, I think, a little bit a, a fallacy to believe that through this kind of instruments, through this kind of policy, you will have a material I impact and uh, it's much more important that others take the responsibility regarding the relative prices or the smart regulation. I think here it's, it's much more dangerous that we lose at the end something that is really contributing a lot to the sustainability and to the robustness of a, of a country. Thank you. So I want to turn to one of the audience questions and, and I think this question, Jean-Pierre, I, I need to address to you because I know you have uh, views on this, uh, uh, not that you don't have views on the other 25 questions that have been <laughs> asked, but, but this one I know is close to your heart. So, so you said before, you know, why did you not focus on some of these issues back in 1972? Well, in part because we were fewer people on the planet, we were less wealthy, and it was less obvious what our collective impact on nature was. Uh, and so one could read into this that the problem is growth. We're more people, we're richer, and that's the problem. And of course, then comes the question, well, do we therefore need to degrow? Um, and that's a question that is hotly debated, particularly uh, by our students. And so, um, Nalek, you spoke about green growth, 
uh, so we'll get to what green growth is in a moment, but perhaps first, um, what is your view on degrowth as a solution to the problems you described? For me, it's quite clear. We need to respect the planetary boundaries. We should do that with one single objective, minimize the loss in welfare for the population in our countries and if possible in the world. Now, if we are not smart enough, respecting the planetary boundaries may well lead to degrowth. That would be a consequence that I would regret. But I think that means we have not been smart enough. And not only smart in terms of innovating technologically, it's probably also finding social solution, institution, yeah. that will make, us po make it possible. But it could be a consequence. If you are not smart enough, it may be that the only possibility to respect planetary boundaries is to have lower growth. Uh, then that's my view. Uh, th this being said, it's very important to see what do we mean by growth, okay? And, and of course, growth is poorly measured today. It's measured in terms of growth, uh, the growth rate of GDP. GDP is a poor measure. Please go to the website of the E4S where you will see a pro proposition to have a green domestic product, which would be a better way to measure the value created in the economy over a period of time. Now, and it could be that in the end, we are going to have degrowth in terms of the bad measure, but we continue to have growth in terms of a good measure. And more importantly even is, of course, we need to uh, make sure that we maintain welfare, and we know that there is not perfect correlation between, let's say, happiness and material properties, material, the level, I mean, purely material consumption. So, uh, I, I, I have this vision that, uh, I, in a sense, I'm, I'm against degrowth. I don't think we should plan degrowth. I think if the degrowth is a consequence, we'll have to accept it. This being said, I think we should think about being a bit more sober. That is, they, they should rethink a bit what is it that makes us happy, what is it that is important, and uh, it's very difficult because, again, we, in the decentralized economy, everybody takes a decision. But whenever we have a, a lever, we should try to use it uh, and possibly be as happy, have similar social welfare, but less imposition on the planet. Yeah. So let's turn then perhaps to this idea of green growth. Um, we have uh, green uh, domestic product. Now we have green growth. I mean, is this terminology or uh, what, you know, just sort of a putting slightly different language on this, or when, when, you, uh, when you speak about green growth, what, what do you have in mind? What do you mean? So we launched our strategy accelerating green growth um, three years ago now. And lit what it means is we have two dashboards. We have our financial metric dashboard with you know, net sales and EBIT and free cash flow and so on and so forth. And then we have our sustainability dashboard with our low carbon targets, our biodiversity targets, our people targets. Um, and all of our leaders are incentivized to deliver on both scorecards at the same time. So there's not one versus the other, it's they have to find a way to make the two work hand in hand. And that is what's driving this sort of catalyst for our people to innovate, put technology to work, to drive more sustainable building solutions so that we can combine financial success with sustainability uh, success so that we are uh, a more prosperous company that way. That's what it means. And what the way it ripples down is that across all of our sites, our people are going out of the way to find new ways of just adding this new constraint into their you know, parameters. Um, and we're also looking at how we can partner with like-minded companies on the same, uh, on the same, uh, in the same movement as us. We're part, for instance, of the First Movers Coalition, that is companies that come together to say, I'm going to put my purchasing power to work to create more demand for green technologies, and we're going to all push ourselves forward to create this systems shift forward. And um, an example is we use hundreds of thousands of trucks around the world to deliver our concrete in lots of cities, and so we have placed an order to uh, our friends at Volvo to say, well, we want to replace 30% of our uh, of our fleets to electric vehicles by 2030. So 
this is the order, make it happen. We're ready to pay a competitive price for this, uh, let's do it. And um, so we're seeing you know, coalitions of companies coming together to, uh, to work hand in hand, to create the demand that's gonna create the technology shift so that we can move this system forward. And we're doing the same likewise, telling our customers, well, you know, ask for more uh, ambitious, low carbon and energy efficient and circular systems, because if you, you, know, if you place the order, we're gonna put our innovation to work to deliver it to you. Jean-Pierre spoke earlier about speed and the need to accelerate, um, and you said 30% of trucks by 2030. Why not 60% or 80%? Yeah, we would love to go much faster. It's a, basically, it's linked to the infrastructure constraints that we have across our markets. We have to follow the pace of the grid and uh, infrastructure availability, but of course, if we could go faster, you know, we're ready. And, and that's, of course, where we turn back again to, to the smart state and, and the assertive state, not necessarily the big state. I, I, I wonder, Isabel, if, if, if you could share with us beyond you know, the important investments that you make available uh, for the private sector, what are some other ideas perhaps that your party has, uh, you know, people you speak with, um, that could really um, make the, the state a, a, a more effective catalyst of the changes that clearly the private sector is, is trying to lead. In the government, we want to be an example too. And for us, uh, we have put the goal of 2040 for the neutrality, carbon neutrality. It will not be easy <laughs> to achieve, I must say. But um, we have begun with our buildings, uh, state buildings, and we have the goal, and we will reach it, this one, of 2035 for um, electricity autonomy. It means we will, um, we will provide and make electricity in, with our buildings more electricity than we use. And when I say all um, um, buildings, it means Cathedral de Lausanne and Chateau Gion is in this building. In those buildings, I cannot put some <laughs> photovoltaics on it. So it means we have to produce more electricity with our other buildings uh, to have this electrical autonomy in 2035, and we will have it. Uh, we have already the money for it in our uh, uh, second climate plan. It means it's um, 80 millions, 18 millions um, next year, and uh, I will need 22 millions in three years to have this uh, autonomy, uh, with this uh, electrical autonomy. And um, um, to achieve it to, um, uh, for example, in the, our new buildings, we are putting a lot of photovoltaics. The last, um, the last building that we had, uh, we ha just have the, the, um, the, the, it's the Ecole, uh, Ecole Professionnelle de Payerne. So the building is looking very strange. Um, I'm calling it the Ninja Turtle because it looks, it looks really like a Ninja Turtles. It's, um, it's in wood. And uh, you have the photovoltaic panels, not on the <coughs> facade, but one meter before, and it's translucid. You can see um, the sun um, under, and you, it's better than the EPFL. Mr. Fetterly, it was built much better than your, your <laughs> building. <laughs> I like it, but you know, for people, when uh, I'm talking about this building in Payerne, because it will be in Payerne, people are quite a little bit shocked. But I say, it's new building will look like that, and we have to, we have to take the opportunity to make a state the example. Mm -hmm. Yes, as a state, we can do such buildings. Yes, terrific. Jean-Pierre. Uh, I, I, I see all that and I, I, and I applaud. I think it's very good. Now, all that will cost, and maybe it could go even faster. Do you think it's a good idea to decrease taxes today? Let me, let me add to that question. <laughs> <laughs> because we have a question from the audience that picks up on what you said about, you know, we destroyed the planet, but we won some elections in the meantime, right? So, so you know, 
Let's assume nobody is listening. Um, <laughs> <laughs> tell us. Oh, it's always a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> the idea, if you have more money, you can invest. If firms have more money, they can invest. And they can invest, for example, for the sustainable transition. transition. So this is the idea. Um, but uh, to talk about another point you have you just talked about um, some minutes before uh, about the produit intérieur vert. We have talked about it a lot of time. I like really this idea. Uh, and um, my, uh, my hope is that the Canton de Vaux will be the first Canton uh, that we try to have this calculate in, in the Canton de Vaux. But I must say, I have not the money yet. <laughs> but so don't decrease taxes. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on it. So you have made us an offer. And uh, I, I think it's a, so a great idea, really. Because with that, the condition I was talking before, that sustainability is a condition of the framework, is taken um, in this idea of produit <coughs> intérieur vert. I like it really much. Terrific. Um, I want to uh, use one of the questions um, that was asked um, by the audience uh, as, as a way of getting some uh, closing thoughts from you because um, I think we are seeing ingredients of a potential happy marriage. You know, there are responsible business leaders who see opportunities to use innovation and drive change. and the Swiss National Bank is going to make sure that the overall framework is going to be conducive, we're going to have monetary stability and that's very good and we're going to have confidence and we want a smart government that is going to lead by example and provide framework conditions and yet uh, the urgency of, of the challenge is such that it's entirely possible that we do all of these things but it's, it's too late. And so I'd love to perhaps get some closing thoughts from you um, either why you are confident uh, that the efforts you're currently making are sufficient, or if you're not confident that the efforts you are each making in your respective leadership roles are sufficient, what more could you do to make sure we achieve this marriage in time? Right, so I'm going to go first. Um, I think going back to this um, notion of collaborating and um, taking a systems approach, the way that we look at it is who are the outliers out there who are moving, who want to move faster, and let's work with them. <coughs> um, and I just came back from New York, and Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, said this remarkably well. He said the 19th century was a century of empires, the 20th century was a century of nation states, and the 21st century is a century of cities. Cities are moving the fastest, taking action, because they are in the front lines of actually managing the consequences of climate change because their constituents are knocking on their door to find solutions to the flooding, the heating, and all of the disasters that, uh, that we all are aware of. So what we're doing at Wholesome is we're working with cities. Uh, we're designing systems to make cities more resilient, bring more nature into cities, um, make cities cooler, um, build more low carbon systems, more circular systems. And I think that the way that we look at it is work with the outliers who are moving the fastest, where you can have the biggest impact with your solutions and and, uh, and just focus on the solution. Thank you. Thomas. Well, it's, uh, it's like a very difficult question because it's a global problem. So we can do a lot, but that is not necessarily uh, then an assurance that everything goes in, in the right direction. So I think we should do everything we can. We should have the right to relative prices. We should give the incentives so that the economy goes in the right direction, but that will give no assurance whether globally all these problems are solved. There's a big fight everywhere and uh, people always agree behind the veil of ignorance when they do not know but when it's uh, something that is uh, limiting their uh, financial resources obviously they often do not agree we see that uh, globally but I'm always I have a positive person so I believe technology could be a big difference so if, if uh, electricity electric cars not only because of the environment because they are better really become something that we can use. I think there we have a big chance by providing uh, the technology so that we can provide prosperity uh, without really uh, then cutting back on prosperity by providing uh, this uh, technology then going in the right direction. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 2050, 
In 2050, my son will be younger than me now. It's a way to say 2050 is tomorrow. So when I, uh, I arrived in my department, I said, as from now, everything we do, every Swiss franc we spend, must be with this condition, under the condition of sustainability and the goal of 2050, uh, neutral carbon in 2050 for the economy and 2040 for the activity of the government. This is the point with all the funds I've told you before, it's uh, under the condition of sustainability. I have the buildings in my department, it's why I've told uh, about you about that. Everything we do, what we build, what we renovate, is under the condition of sustainability. Thank you. Jean-Pierre, what has made you more hopeful and uh, what perhaps no, not? I, I, I wanted to say two things to, if this is that word. First, technology, I totally agree. I mean, technology, is, is the easy, easy way out, except that we need to do more. So uh, basically I would say more money for EPFL. <laughs> <laughs> and of course that's a bit of a joke, but we have to think outside the box. We have to think, it's not the moment to restrict budget to the higher, higher education. It's not the moment to not make an agreement with Europe for or, or Horizon 20. We, again, we are sitting, uh, I mean, we are close to sitting in the campfire. The, the, the planet is being destroyed. We need to do a lot more. That's one direction if we want more technology. <coughs> the other direction, and I, I agree with you, I mean, democracy, it's extremely difficult to, to move and, and, and I, th this is a postulate for me. Of course, I could have given you a solution if I was the autocrat. But no, democracy has to, be, has to be the postulate. And then on that, what can I say? If you did not plan to vote in two or three weeks, go and vote. There you go. Terrific. Um, so, so, so Rudy has done a a wonderful job um, summarizing your, your many, many contributions, uh, Jean-Pierre, so I'm not going to try to, to do that. What, I'll, what I will say, though, is that I think um, this discussion that we just had, the fact that we had this discussion, uh, says a lot about you. I spoke to Martin before the event, and I said, you always do it this way. And he said, well, you know, usually these things take place within the confines of an academic department, and, you know, usually the person who gives the lecture you know, takes the full time to give the lecture. Uh, and instead what you did is, uh, you know, you, you shared the evening, you brought us all together, you wanted there to be a discussion. Uh, and I think it, it, it says a lot about who you are. You bring people together, uh, you appreciate, you cherish diverse viewpoints, um, you enjoy deep intellectual discourse, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you care about impact, you care about getting things done, you care about moving uh, the needle. And it, it is this urgency, this, this earnestness, this purposefulness in everything that you do that makes you such a wonderful colleague, that makes you a role model, that makes you an inspirational leader. And I want to thank you for all of that. And I want to thank you on behalf of all of us for the gift of this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Merci d'avoir Let's go for a drink. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>